This filmmaker cheated on set and in doing so, made a better movie. So recently I watched the new version of Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot, that's a pretty awful impression, the 2017 version of Murder on the Orient Express. I say the 2017 version because this is a story that's been adapted for TV or cinema at least four times before. That includes a German version from the 1950s, Ich Hercule Poirot, star-studded 1970s film adaptation that included the likes of Sean Connery, Albert Finney and Lauren Bacall, and also Anthony Perkins. That's right, the Anthony Perkins, who played Norman Bates in Psycho. There's an oddly undercooked adaptation of it from 2001 as well, where Alfred Molina plays... The name is Poirot, Hercule Poirot. Yeah. It's not great. David Suchet version from 2010. Was it not Linda Arden to make the mockery of Poirot? A Japanese TV version in 2015. Yeah, watching that later. And finally, the 2017 version in which Kenneth Branagh directs and also stars as Hercule Poirot. Am I, am I getting any better with that impression? No, it is medieval. Now the problem this story has always had when it's come to being adapted is its location. It's almost entirely set on a train, a very long and narrow train, confined passenger cabins and rather skinny, narrow carriages. It makes for a very cramped space to tell a whodunit murder mystery. Yes, it makes for a very tense and dramatically interesting story, but it also creates a very limited amount of space to visually tell it. And of all the versions I've been able to track down, this is a common problem. In the third act, at the pivotal moment when Poirot is going to unmask the killer in front of the 12 suspects, there's somewhat of a problem in that it always ends up looking like other bits of the movie that came before. Visually speaking, it's no more interesting than the film was an hour previously. And that's because there's little space to do anything that different. It's always one train, one carriage, in a space that can fit 12 suspects, doesn't really allow much in the way of blocking or movement. So what does a good director do when faced with such obstacles? Well, they would do what any good director would do and any new director would be quick to learn. They cheat. The other versions, including that quite terrible one with Alfred Molina. Why not pounce upon him as the lion pounces on the gazelle? Yeah, still terrible. They all take their story cues from the book from Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express. And it might sound like sacrilege to change that up, but Agatha Christie wasn't a film director. And when you take charge of a movie, you take charge of the story that that movie comes with. Kenneth Branagh quite literally decides to throw the book out of the train carriage window. In the original text, as the train is moving through a mountainous area, it is hemmed in by snow and has to stop. That snow keeps every character within the book trapped on the train. In Kenneth Branagh's version, he decides to cheat the story. As the murder investigation part of the story begins to get underway, Kenneth Branagh uses this moment to move the story visually to another space entirely. Because if the train is too small, Branagh believes we should all get off the train. Now I know what you're thinking, mountainous area, snow hemming in the train, how could anyone do any detective-y things in an environment as hostile as that. Quite right, if we're gonna get off the train and not freeze like popsicles, then we're probably gonna need some sort of shelter. But what kind of shelter do you get on a train track? Easy, it's a tunnel. A large overhang of rock. How about a tunnel? Some kind of hovering bird of prey that keeps the snow off with its big feathery wings. How about a tunnel? An igloo! Nope. It's a tunnel. Wasn't in the original text, wasn't in the original story, isn't in any of the other adaptations, but so what? This is Branagh's movie, and in Branagh's movie, there's a tunnel. Now we have a much wider, darker, more dramatic space in which our characters can move around, but also make our movie more visually interesting. But he's not building this much more interesting set piece just to shoot this one scene in. Actually, it's going to be used for that finale in which we can sit down all of our suspects in a line in a very Last Supper-esque type visual. But it also provides us with a new visual dynamic. Whereas before Poirot was in the center of the carriage talking to all the suspects, now Poirot stands between the train and the tunnel 
out in the cold whilst all his suspects are hunkered down around the table, all joined by the suspicion of guilt. It's a great setup and it really does introduce something more visually interesting to a well-worn story. But it's not the only example of how Branner has made this story more visually interesting. In the original text, as well as those other adaptations, Poirot awakes from sleep to find the train snowed under. So as an audience, we never actually get to see the train coming to a stop. At least not in any sense that would be visually interesting. Branner's version manages to crank up the visual drama in this moment to the max. As the train travels through the mountains under a thunderstorm, lightning strikes a mountain peak and creates an avalanche. That avalanche hurtles towards the train tracks, forcing the train to stop, with most of the carriages coming to a halt precariously on a bridge suspended hundreds of feet above a snowy ravine. That's triple suspense points. Now, whether you enjoy this version of Murder on the Orient Express and that moustache more than its predecessors, it's hard to argue that when faced with a bunch of ideas that feel constrictive to how you both want to shoot your movie and build drama and tension within it, that just exploring how you might be able to cheat some of those obstacles can often open up new and more interesting approaches that ultimately mean you're going to make a better movie. It certainly did for Hercule Poirot. No, sorry, I'm terrible at that. How'd you do it, David? And then you put in the little Belgian, the little French, up, 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 and there you are, you have Hercule Poirot. But making a more visually appealing movie isn't always just about rewriting the script. It's also about having a really good knowledge of the basics when it comes to the rules of composition. And if you click on this video right here, it's going to tell you all about one of those rules. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching, filmmaker.